treasure treasure that will follow its owner everywhere i on behalf of i triple e bvm student branch welcome you all to the fourth session of virtual visit on modern physics 2020 hope you all had a wonderful learning weekend up till now today is the day we were all waiting for yes today we are lucky enough to have a look at the world's most advanced technological institute the cern laboratories large hadron collider atlas experiment i would request dr indrajit patel the principal of birla vishwakarma mahavidyalaya to inaugurate today's session and flourish us with his inspiring words yes good evening friends i'm delighted to again be with you all on a very very exciting session the fourth session on the third day of the virtual visit on modern physics organized by iit pali student branch and npss i remember 29th of april the inaugural session of the tech conclave 2020 when one of the senior scientist dr atna sharma she highlighted the various experimentation work which are being carried out at san geneva when the youth of india they are engaged to know about the draw of the ipl they are excited to know the who will be the finals in the caribbean premier league they are excited who will be going to the quarter finals of the us open the students at billa vishwakarma mahavidyalaya they are engaged in a very creative work through this virtual visit on modern physics again one of the flagship event in the history of billa vishwakarma mahavidyalaya today the two very senior professionals dr t1 and dr clara they will take us to the virtual visit on the atlas lhs experiment at the sun laboratory geneva one of the very advanced laboratory where the experimentation of physics then atomic science as well as the big bang theory that i have witnessed during the presentation of arsena sharma has been continuously doing many researchers the students the ignited mind the creative mind of the students as well as researchers as well as a professional like all of us will be benefited the first lecture of this virtual visit started with a very scientific address by dr jyotam chatobadhyay a senior scientist at nasa he has really boosted this particular 6 days a week session a really a very very impressive so far the students of the science students of these technologies are concerned for molding their future for the their development for the development of the technical fraternity for the development of the nations and globe at large during this pandemic season of covid 2019 we are hearing the lot of new terminology like augmented reality virtual reality and some type of simulations which we addresses for some experimental based learning some sharing of the thoughts sharing of the ideas sharing of our information to this ar or vr technology but this is a really impressive uh, action which is going to be happen today that virtual vr will, will be taken right to the place where all these experimentations are being carried out by the researchers at the sun laboratory geneva i will share a couple of my experience when i visited the united states state of america in 2004 and particular universal studio and particularly the space mission the simulation lab of the space technology then when uh, we were taken we were sitting in one seat and seat belts and helmets and all these accessories are being hooked up on us 
and then we are taken to the skies and galaxy and what the experience the thrilling we had at that time another experience when i visited 2004 the university of uh, memorial university of marine technology in uh, new finland uh, canada then we were taken to one of the virtual platform and we were traveling in the atlantic and the pacific ocean a lot of glaciers are coming a lot of shark and whales are coming we can see lighthouse we can see sun rising we can see the sun setting a real a simulation which will engage yourself engage your mind in some reality through some virtual platform through some simulations but the today's event is one of the very prominent event that you will be taken right to the place right to the experimentation setup right to the various galleries where this big experiments are taken or conducted on the modern physics so this is really a miracle what we can say the students the faculty advisors have taken a very keen interest to connect the people across the globe who are doing a wonderful work for the experiment for the research for the innovations the ultimate goal of all the researchers or all the stakeholders how we can be benefited to ourselves how we can benefit to the mankind how we can benefit to the nature by exploring all these possible ideas all the possible thoughts all such possible experimentations going through all such innovation and we can build our ecosystem because recently our federal government we have declared a new education policy it is not confining the students between two pages of a textbook or four wall of the classroom the students must be exposed to the latest environment to latest development to latest researches the latest thoughts which are imbibing in the minds of the people who are working on various stations on the earth on the space lab in the globe i mean in the sky or in the submarine below 100 feet or the thousands of meters below the water so now the work is not uh, i mean stationary at one place or at one site the things are doing all over the globe all around the galaxy and they are interconnected to come out the best possible solution for particular experiment so really we are doing wonderful the students are doing wonderful with the support of the ieee south asia pacific uh, pacific region the ieee chapter the global chapters and the senior scientists senior academicians senior innovators are igniting they are sparkling our students our faculties on our campus and i am happy to share that that again i will recall that particular tech conclave 2020 a tremendous uh, i mean uh, report has been uh, positive report has been encased by the society across the globe 28000 plus witnessed from 32 countries it is a not small task so this is the mission which the young students of billa vishwakarma mahavidyalay is spreading to imbibe our quality to enhance our quality to enhance our thought processes how we can explore this ignited minds to the real world so billa vishwakarma mahavidyalay a premier institutions working in the field of engineering and technology work with the motto work is workship we believe to work with the vision to produce globally employable innovative engineers with the core values the activities which are conducted by our faculty chapters by our student chapters by our outreach programs will definitely address is the vision with which this great billa vishwakarma mahavidyalay engineering college was established pre independence 14 june 1948 inaugurated by his excellency lord mount beton at that time so the team bbm always worry about how we can support the students community how we can support our stakeholders how we can justify the needs of the community dr apj abdul kalam really spoke that reaching to the unreach is the real development of the nation so with this vision with this opening remark i congratulate team i triple e student branch congratulate the faculty advisor the student chairs as well as the entire team of i triple e who has taken this care i thank you sanjeeva 
for constantly accepting our innovation i mean invitations for in each of our endeavors and today's expert dr steven and dr clara to motivate our students to enlighten our students and this event will be watched live on the youtube by thousands of people across the globe so really again this will be a flexible and historical event in the history of billa vishkarma mahavidyalay so i extend a heartily thanks to the administrator of the san geneva and particularly this atlas lhs experimental lab setup for providing us opportunity not in a person but through this virtual let me hope that in future when the conditions are good we are out of pandemic we would like to visit sun in person in geneva so that we can meet you one to one face to face and uh, body to body so may god bless all of us got a better future thank you all my best wishes thank you sir that was quite cheerful now i would request dr mukesh shimpi sir associate dean of r&d department birla vishwakarma mahavidyalaya to introduce our keynote speakers oh very good evening to one and all today is session 4 for virtual visit to atlas experiment at large hadron collider lhc i dr m e simpi associate dean r&d birla vishwakarma mahavidyalaya college welcome our two speakers at virtual visit on modern physics organized by ieee bbm ieee npss under npiu at bbm our first speaker dr steven golfer who is a researcher at atlas experiment sun he is a particle physicist from the university of melbourne working on the atlas experiment on the large had drawn colliders at the uh, sun the european laboratory for particle physics he is also co-chair the international particle physics outreach group ipopg a collaboration of researchers and communication experts committed to improving and sharing best practices for educating the people the public of the goals and achievements of particle physics he is a coordinator for the university of michigan undergraduate summer students and semester abroad program at cern he is also a member of various societies which include european association of communication directors eacd american physical society aps european physical society he was awarded with digital communication award in 2012 for the best online events organized under atlas virtual visit program dr steven was selected a fellow of forum of outreach and engaging the public of the american physical society in 2016 uh, our second speaker for today's session is dr clara nelly dr clara nelly is an excellent initiative fellow at redbud university and a science communicator her research is with the atlas experiment at cern with a focus on the analysis of coupling to massive bosons she also worked on novel pixel detectors for the upgrade of the inner layers of the detector and on the analysis of higgs boson when it changes into tau particle on behalf of organizing team and on behalf of myself we will welcome welcome our both speakers for the session thank you thank you very much thank you very much thank you doctor thank you professor uh it it is our pleasure uh to invite you here to cern uh i will start by apologizing that there will be plenty of background noise while we're here because there is a lot of work going on on the accelerator and on the detector so you will hear all sorts of noises things even some things that sound like alarms when they move the cranes and things like that we'll try to speak louder than that um let me uh you introduce oh, yeah thank you very much steve so my name is clara nellis 
and uh, I am a particle physicist working on Atlas. So thank you very much for the wonderful uh, introduction. And uh, we're very excited to tell you more about our experiment. And, and, uh, and I also, I, I would like to thank uh, the whole the organization, the institutes, uh, IEEE, for having uh, organized this. It sounds like a fantastic event. All of the uh, it's tremendous. I think it's good. And that your students have an opportunity to see what's, what's really going on. As, as you said, Professor, uh, we would love to have each and every one of you come over here and to come visit, visit whenever. It, the world has different things in mind, and that uh, we must wear masks. We're following social distancing um, to try to prevent the spread of COVID. We hope that there'll be a solution for that soon. Our colleagues in medicine are working on that in biology. Um, we're working in a different area. Very fundamental things. I'll give you just a little, a brief the context of where we're at. Um, we're on, for now. We're we're beneath. Uh, we're a hundred meters uh, under the ground. This experiment. This experiment is one of many experiments at CERN, European Laboratory for Particle Physics. I'm so glad. We're lowering parts into the uh, CERN founded shortly after the end of World War II together uh, country people who have been fighting each other. To care less about war. We've got work to do. We've got a universe to try to understand. That recipe worked. We had started with all of the different as members of CERN, and it's now expanding outside of Europe. A very large and important wall of trying to. We have many people from India. Who are working on Atlas and working on the other experiments, it's, and it's, it's fantastic. That's that's what the environment is like here. So we have been focused since 1954, when CERN was founded, on trying to answer very basic questions. We want to understand uh, what are the fundamental components of nature. What are the Lego bricks, the smallest Lego bricks that we use to build our universe? We're still working on trying to answer that. We've gotten quite a ways along the way. And the different experiments over time have gone up to higher and higher energies in order to probe smaller and smaller dimensions. You can really think of the Large Hadron Collider right now as the world's most powerful microscope. We're trying to probe down to the smallest possible dimensions to understand what we're made out of. So that's CERN. Uh, outside of the Large Hadron Collider, which is perhaps its flagship right now, the highest energy accelerator, there are other very important accelerators. Uh, they're working on antimatter. Uh, as an example, we're able to produce anti-hydrogen and to try to study its spectrum and to see if it's similar to hydrogen, try to understand if it falls up or down. Very basic questions we're trying to answer uh, in there. There's, there's, quite a few, there's several experiments, in fact, working on antimatter. There are also experiments that are working on the produce isotopes uh, for medical research, trying to uh, make not only uh, methods to probe, but methods to treat uh, people. Uh, maybe Claire, I'll let Clara come in and tell us a little bit about what's going on in the Large Hadron Collider. Okay. So hopefully you can hear me okay. So, uh, yeah, the Large Hadron Collider is currently shut down. Um, so we have been uh, not running for about two years now and this is uh, scheduled, it's very normal, it's to uh, upgrade our detector and the collider and to perform any repairs that need to happen which, which can happen uh, whilst we're running, some, some things need to be repaired. So we're shut down for two years and part of the reason for this length of time is that we have to warm up the accelerator. Um, so it's, it's one of the coldest places in the universe. And we uh, then have to warm it up very slowly um, 
check all of the different components on the LHC and on the detectors uh, and give people time to, to perform these repairs. And we're scheduled sort of next year to start running again. So, so one of the, the good things about the timing of this event is that this means that we can come underground during the shutdown period and, and show you our uh, detector, which we wouldn't usually be able to do whilst we're running. We couldn't be here whilst the detector in the LHC was on. Exactly. Even better than that, uh, because our detector has been pulled apart uh, to do work, which you can certainly hear in the background, uh, we're going to go down and we're going to let you see. You're going to see a little bit inside the detector. It's an enormous device. Uh, many people ask why we have to have such an enormous device uh, to look for the smallest uh, components of nature. Uh, but the answer is exactly that. It, it's energy. So the uh, in order to have an accelerator, the uh, Large Hadron Collider takes and collides protons. It passes beams of protons through each other so the components of the protons, the quarks and the gluons, can interact. At four different places along the ring, the beams pass through each other and collisions happen. Atlas is one of those places. If we were to walk down the other direction a ways, you would end up at an experiment called ALICE. Uh, ALICE is a special experiment designed to look at collisions of heavy ions. If we were to walk behind me in the other direction, uh, you would walk. You would find an experiment that's called LHCB. LHCB is trying to answer a fundamental question: is why, why do we exist? Why didn't uh, matter and antimatter annihilate each other completely at the beginning of the universe, and there there only be energy that remains? We don't get that. We shouldn't be here, but we are. So we're trying to understand why. And across the way, as I mentioned is uh, the other fundamental general purpose uh, experiment called CMS. Both ATLAS, the one you're at now, and CMS are enormous collaborations, roughly 5,000, even more than 5,000 people on each collaboration working together to do research. So- Sorry to interrupt, so I just ahead, wanted to point point. out, right. so if you could look at the video from my feed as well, then we have some people working on the detector right now. Oh, yeah. So this gives you a, a sense of the scale, just in case from the video it's, it's hard to tell. And then we also have at the back of the room some people working on the detector as well back there. And something that's quite interesting to note is that we don't build this detector on the ground in complete and then bring it down in one piece. It's so big, we have to build it in different sections above ground and then we use this shaft which reaches to the surface to bring each piece down and then like a ship in a bottle we build the detector in this cavern so it was constructed here in this space. So what I think what we're going to do now is we're going to walk you down some stairs so you can have a better view at the end of our detector and you can take a look inside of it. And then we'll take you on a walk alongside uh, the detector and talk a little bit about how it works. And then I wanna spend a lot of time answering questions and Clara and I are ready. If you have difficult questions, I'll pass them to Clara. <laughs> uh, she's younger than I am, so she can answer them. And, uh, and we'll both uh, let you know a little bit about what it's like to, to work on, on a wonderful uh, experiment like this. So shall we uh, yep. take a look? I'm gonna, I'm gonna turn around this video so you can see awesome. down there as well. We were both showing you our view from way up. Yeah. So we're way up above right now. And we came from there down via elevator, but we're way up on top of the detector, which is actually, uh, it's, it's roughly 26 meters in height and 46 meters from one end uh, to the other. So it's half of a football pitch from one end uh, to the other. So we'll take you with us. We're going we're to walk down. You get to walk down the steps with us. There's a lot of steps. <laughs> I, I understand, actually, that uh, later on, I don't know if it's this week, but it, as part of the program, you have a physicist who's going to come and talk to you about a new, new concepts in accelerators, uh, which can 
use much less space than this. That's a, it's a great idea. So here, I, I can let you see here, we've come down a bit. So we're, we're almost standing on top of the detector. In fact, you can see right here, the very far end of our detector. Every place you look, it's filled with cables and electronics. We have roughly 100, actually, I think it's more than 100 million channels that we read out of data from the experiment. So when we're running, there are collisions going on right in the center of this detector. And the collisions are coming, they were coming at this relatively slow rate of 40 million per second. And that's going to go up. And that's what we're preparing for. We're going to have much, much more data coming into the detector. Each one of those 100 million channels has to be ready every 25 nanoseconds to take data. Uh, so the data come because charged particles or neutral particles coming out from the collisions come out into the detector and leave a trace. We get little dots left in our detector, little spots of little bits of charge, which we then have to reconstruct to see what happened at the collision. This just shows you really much the, the top, the central part there. This is the, the end cap here. We've moved things already. We brought out part of the one of the large wheels that we have around here, we simply call them the big wheels, yep. and we've moved it all the way out uh, so that we can get access and go inside. And people are working inside. These components of the detector here, in fact, let's go downstairs and you can see a little bit better mm -hmm. these components. Because uh, uh, I'm very proud of them because my institute I was working for uh, helped to build them. Uh, they're fascinating devices. You can see, get a good look right here. Uh, these tubes here, you can see a lot of tubes going all the way down. These are parts of the detector designed uh, to detect and measure muons. Muons are fundamental particles. They're charged particles. They're just like electrons, except they're more massive. Uh, you can ask me why. I don't know why. <laughs> We're, it's, it's one of the questions we're trying to answer is why are there several different families of particles, each with different masses? Uh, we hope we can find an answer to that. The LHC might not get there, but we hope so. Uh, these tubes, what happens, what's, what's interesting about them is uh, we use ionization. If you know the concept, we have two concepts you guys need to know. We'll have a quiz at the end of this, right? <laughs> so one concept is that a charged particle uh, in a magnetic field will curve. Okay, that's one concept. Right? The other concept you have to know is ionization. So if a charged particle goes through certain types of gas or material, it will knock off electrons. And you can measure that. Now what happens in here, each of these tubes has a wire in the middle. You can't see that here, but it has a wire going down the middle. There's a high voltage between the wire and the tube, and there's gas that can ionize between the tube and the wire. And so when the charged particle goes through, it can ionize the gas. Electrons will go to the wire, which has a more positive charge than the, than the outside, and a positive voltage, let me say. And then it will leave a little charge on that wire. We will read that out, and using timing, we can tell at what radius of this simple tube here the particle went through. And then we reconstruct the curve of the particle that went through. And because we built an enormous magnetic field around this detector, we will see that the particle curves. And from its curvature, we can figure out how fast it was going. What was its momentum when it went through? So this is how we go about using such an enormous detector to try to measure the most fundamental uh, components of nature, the, the, the particles. And by the way, I should just, just to make sure it's really clear, these when we say particle, when Clara and I say particle, mm -hmm. it means it's something fundamental. It has no structure to it. It's not made up of anything. Okay. Uh, if we're wrong, then we have to redo our model. But that would be very exciting. That would be great. It's one of the things we look for. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, compositeness, it's called. Uh, and there's no reason to think it's not there. We've learned in the past uh, from people like Democritus, who was absolutely right to say that atoms were the smallest thing. 
until he was wrong, <laughs> we found out something different. So, um, so this is, you know, this is what we're trying to understand. We're pretty sure from our model that these particles are fundamental. And, uh, and well, you know, it's physics, so yeah. maybe we'll be wrong. Mm -hmm. that, that'll be great when we're wrong. So Actually, as physicists, one of the best things is when we're wrong. That's yeah. the most exciting thing. That's how, how we go forward. Yeah. Actually. That's actually how we go forward. So let's let's go down a little bit more, and then we can take them along this along the side of the detector. Okay. So, so, okay. okay, so we're going to keep looking? Yeah, we have to go to the other side here. It's a complicated place here. We built just enough room in here for us to move around. Not enough room for you to really get a full picture of the detector. Oh, sure. So just to let you know about the equipment that we're wearing. So because this is an active uh, physics lab, then we have to protect our heads from anything that could either fall or that we bump them. And um, we are both wearing our dosimeters. So even though we don't expect any radiation down here, in fact, we expect less radiation down here than we would get on the surface uh, because that it is an active lab and there is a possibility that there could have been some leftover radiation from the LHC, even though we don't expect it. We always wear our dosimeters to check when we're in these kind of environments, what kind of irradiation exposure we're getting. And it's just a precaution. We don't expect to get any down here. And then we have lights as well, just in case there's an emergency and we need to evacuate. But again, all of these things are precautionary. Exactly. And hard shoes. And hard shoes, yeah. Steel-toed shoes, <laughs> in case anything falls. Yeah. I, I like to show, one of the things, when I come down here, I do a lot of visits, virtual visits. I'm always got my camera on, I got my phone going, uh, because I always see new things that are interesting. And one of the things I've been photographing recently, and I think, you know, it amazes me, is just the sort of services that you need to run a detector like this. These lines here carry gas to the detectors. There's also a, a simple ground wire. There's signal wires. You can see various tubes for mixtures of the gases, a supply of carbon dioxide that goes into there. The, the things, I think what amazes me most is not the existence of these things, but you know, if you take a look like this, at these electronics, it's the fact that every single one of those cables, every single one of those wires was put there by a human hand. So that gives you an idea of just how much effort it took to to design and then to build these detectors. They were built in, uh, in institutes all around the globe and then brought here and, and put together and assembled here. I, so, think, yeah. I think that's a really important point as well because uh, a lot of people think of the physicists that are working here, but actually we need engineers, we need electrical engineers, we need computer scientists, we need experts in so many different fields uh, to bring everything together to make this happen. So the physics is just one small part. We really need the, I mean, imagine having to design the construction to hold the weight of this whole detector. So we really need people who are experts in that as well. Imagine uh, the story of the, the, there was one technician and she put a wire in this, in this tube. And that, that wire was the last measurement of a muon. And that muon was the last event that gave us the, the Higgs boson discovery. Yeah. Okay, so every, everybody, everybody who contributed to this uh, did something that was heroic. And, and, and that's what's wonderful to, to work in, in, in collaborations like this. All right, let's go down. Okay. I think let's go one more, right? I don't think that we can get out there. Let's go down one more to get. Right? I don't think there is. Or maybe two more, okay. Yeah, here we are. One more. Yeah. Here we are. So I'm going to take you down here. You can see even even inside here we have elevators. <laughs> so just to get inside and around our detector. Uh, we're just over right here. We're just over the LHC. 
this down there, and we'll, we'll give you another view of that, the, the blue that's down there is a shielding around the Large Hadron Collider. You can also see there's a lot of, uh, a lot of effort had to be made. These devices here, uh, they help to align the detector. This detector, which is, as I said, is 26 meters from, from top to bottom, has a precision of tens of microns. We have to align that. We have to make sure we know at any time where all the different components of that detector are uh, in order to get precise measurements out. The more precise measurements we can make, the higher energy things we can explore. And that's how we find new physics. So we're going to go through this door here. And then you'll have a, a, an even better view. You might see a bit more. A larger test here. All right, why don't we, uh, <laughs> we'll come over here and let you go. <laughs> All right. uh, there go. So this, this will show you the sort of the iconic view um, of the detector that many people recognize. Okay. So here you can see the the wheels for the muons. So as Steve was talking about uh, to detect the muons, this is still part of that detector. Um, so this is an iconic view of the Atlas detector, and it gives you an idea of the scale. Uh, and that blue section down there, this is where the LHC beam comes in. We'll come in when everything's back up together. So that is the center, the heart of the detector. <clears throat> it's the center of radio lead. Yeah, we're going to right. walk you down that way so you can see. Uh, like this, this is a wonderful thing, too. It's just like us physicists, whenever we come down here, we take photographs. So do the workers. <laughs> uh, <laughs> we love it. You can actually see uh, these, these uh, yellow-brown chambers here. They're different than the tubes in that they're designed not to give you precision in space, but precision in time. They can take a picture in a nanosecond. So they let us know that a particle's gone through at a specific time, and then we can go search in the electronics for that specific time and keep that data. We can't keep all the data. Yeah. We keep very little of it, in fact. Uh, only the stuff where we know there was a track going through or there was a certain amount of energy or some sort of signature of something we're looking for. We do keep some random things yeah. just to make sure we're not missing anything. Uh, but it's a huge amount of data. There's it was roughly, in rough terms, uh, about a, a petabyte of data per second that's coming into that detector. So we obviously can't keep all of that. Uh, we only keep we only keep some. So there, let me go oh, back up here so we can see also. So that's the end of the detector. And uh, from this side, this is what we call the barrel starts around here. You can see more tubes in there to measure muons. Inside from there, there's something we call a calorimeter. A calorimeter, as you might guess, is something that measures energy. Measures calorimeter, something like heat, energy. Uh, when uh, particles come into there, uh, it's designed, it's very dense. It's designed to stop them and to, to measure how much energy they've deposited. And that tells you the energy of that particle. And uh, in between, there's these kind of big tubes with orange straps on them. That's part of our magnet system. We have a very special magnet system, very powerful. It's superconducting uh, in order to get very high fields. We use that to curve the charged particles so we can measure the momentum. These are the, the ends here are from the barrel. And then this big gear looking thing there uh, that's the end cap magnet system. So it also curves the muons that make it through the outside. What we can't show you from here uh, is inside, inside of that calorimeter, uh, way at the central core, you'll find uh, tracking chambers, chambers which we, we call the inner detector, and they measure charged particles very precisely. Again, to 10 microns, uh, even better precision than the muons out here. On the inside, we measure all the charged particles 
and uh, and then reconstruct uh, what gave birth to those particles. We, we, typically what happens, we have a collision, we know what we put into it, we know that there are protons going in, and then we measure what comes out of it, all of the charge and, and neutral particles that come out of it. And then we go to theorists and say, look, we got all this, you know, what do you make out of it? And they tell us what happened in the middle. The, the truth is in the middle, in the very central place uh, where something can be produced, like a Higgs boson, uh, we'll never get there. There's a guy at Heisenberg who told us, we're not allowed in there. We will never, no matter how precise we build this detector, there's, there's area in there that we will never be able to see directly. So we come up with a theory to predict what's going to come out. So it's, it has to explain everything we've measured and then make new predictions. Our current theory is called the standard model, and it's been extraordinary for far too long, 50 years. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's been great. It has made many, many predictions, including the Higgs boson prediction. And yet, uh, we, we want it to be wrong at some point. So we're measuring it as precisely as possible. And the reason we want it to be wrong is because we're missing 95% of our universe. Yeah. There's a lot of things out there we do not understand. Uh, so you want to maybe mention some, mention maybe some of the physics that, that you're working on? Yeah, so, I mean, there's two ways to discover new particles. So one way is to find a brand new particle. Um, so we did this with the Higgs boson, uh, and that was very exciting. So we, we measured all of the data, and we found this bump in a number of different what we call channels. It's when the we look at the particles that come out, uh, and we can say, as Steve was just saying, that there was a, a Higgs boson in the center of that collision, we think, from the, the particles that we've measured. The other way to test the standard model and to really see if it, how we can break it, how we can find out where there are inconsistencies, is to test what we already know as precisely as possible. So my research is looking at the top part and also at the Higgs boson and I look at how they interact with each other uh, and how they interact with other particles. And I see if they are doing this at the rate that we expect. Mm -hmm. And we are uh, measuring this as precisely as possible, hoping that at a very minute level, we can find some difference between what the standard model predicts and what we measure. Mm -hmm. And so these precision measurements are, they're very nice to do, but they're also very important in our search for new physics because it could be that, for example, we're looking at the Higgs boson and the top quark interacting with each other and something is happening slightly more frequently and that tells us that there's another particle or another force boson that is uh, interacting within that uh, interaction uh, that we hadn't yet predicted. Mm -hmm. And so that's, that's one way that we can really tease apart the standard model. And, and look for inconsistencies. And as yeah. Steve says, unfortunately, it's been very, very successful. We haven't managed to break it yet. Yeah. That's, that's very interesting. I mean, exactly what Claire is saying is, is to understand uh, the quantum world, the world that we're measuring, we have to think really differently. Uh, we think in probabilities. Mm -hmm. We can, our model gives us predictions of probability. What is the probability of certain things happening, certain particles being produced? and for them decaying into other particles, or trans I should say, transforming into other particles. Yeah. Essentially, how things work is that something that's more massive can spontaneously transform to something less massive. That's energy, right? mc squared can become e. Uh, and that's, we, we, we use that to measure and to reconstruct the mc squared that was formed. We start by accelerating very light particles, the fundamental part, the particles uh, which are the lightest, which no longer can transform into anything, uh, those particles which make us up the up quark, the down quark, and electrons are it. That's all you need. If you want to, if you want to make a, a, if you want to make a clear, yep. all you need up quark, down quark, and electrons. Maybe a few bosons to hold them together. There you go. You can, you can go there so you can stick, stick together. That's what you need. Uh, but we have found over time that there are many other particles that are the same but more massive. And they, uh, in order for us to study them, we have to produce them. So we take protons, which are up and down quarks, 
and we give them energy. And that energy then transforms into mass in the center of the detector. E becomes MC squared. And you have a variety of different reactions that we see can happen in there. But we're doing the whole E equals MC squared all the time. Yep. We're producing it, and then we're watching it uh, convert back to energy and measuring that. That's how we put everything together. Maybe we can take you, uh, you can see, <laughs> this is a, it's very impressive how high up we are. Um, one, of the, one of the things, Alexander, if you can actually see it from where you're at, uh, it always impresses me. The LHC wasn't complicated enough to build. So <laughs> we built it on land that's at a slight angle. There are mountains uh, to the right and a lake to the left. And as a result, the LHC is at a slight angle in order to be underground 100 meters. Uh, and you can actually see that if you look at this orange platform that holds material, uh, it has a slight angle to it. You can just barely make out. And then you can tell that it, the LHC is going up that, that direction goes up a little bit. Yeah. That means that this whole wheel, for example, is about half a meter uh, further to the right at the top than it is at the bottom. I can't really tell that, but <laughs> that's, that's what we had to do. We had to build our entire uh, detector at a, at a very slight angle. We can, um, we can take you down so you can get an idea of the length of the detector. We'll take you down to the other side. And then I think we can spend some time answering yeah, questions. Absolutely. We hope we have a lot of questions uh, to ask us. So we can take... Well, actually, when we walk by, I want to show you a few things that are kind of interesting to me. I mentioned the alignment system. If you look on some of these detectors, you can actually see there's little targets. And in some places, there's little holes. And those are made so that you can have cameras which, which take pictures and allow us to see if the detector has moved. Uh, so we have a whole system just to make sure uh, that we keep track of all what we call the conditions data in, in what uh, what position was everything, what was the high voltage, the current, what was the mixture of the gas at the specific time that an event happened. And then we can make corrections so we get even more precision. Here, here we are really at the, at the middle of the, the detector. And... Uh, you can see all the different services, the different gases that you need uh, for running the detector. Uh, some are used for, for detecting the particles, others perhaps to cool, uh, the cabling, pipes. So maybe, maybe to say that uh, if you come to visit Geneva, you can come underground to visit this detector and we would absolutely love to welcome you. Yes, absolutely. But you cannot come to this part. So no. this is a very special view of the detector that people don't usually get to see. So we are taking you right through the heart of the detector to, to sections that only the engineers and the physicists usually visit. Right. You lucky people. <laughs> I love coming here on these visits, so thank you again for inviting me. We're going to show you now, we're going all the way down to the other end. Uh, hopefully it's not too loud down here, that should be okay. And here you can see the other detector. And something interesting, this central component here is our small wheel. Our small wheel also detects muons. We have three different layers of muon detector in order to measure three points so we can measure the curve. Because we're going to have many more collisions per second when we turn back on, we need to have a detector that can handle the higher rate. And so we're in the process of building two new, what we call new small wheels, and we're gonna replace these. That's our first step towards the high luminosity LHC. Uh, after that, we're gonna run for several years, and then we're gonna shut down again, and we're gonna replace a large part of the detector that's on the inside. There's gonna be a lot of changes going on not just for Atlas, for all the experiments, and also for the accelerator. We have many steps. These phases were, uh, were planned. Uh, we've shifted in time a little bit because of COVID, but we are going to continue on with the schedule and uh, make all these replacements and be able to take more data. This is to answer the questions that Clara was talking about, and that's, are there small differences from what we have predicted? The only way to find out if there are small differences is to have a lot of data. So 
So if you have if you have billions and billions of events, you can see if something that's only a, a few in a billion probability exists, and that's what we're measuring. We're looking for precision. Okay, so this this gives you an idea. We have on this side. There's also another shaft to lower the technical components. This is the other end. A small wheel. And you can sort of see inside a little bit to see the calorimeter that's inside there, uh, inside the detector. Yeah, so hopefully you can hear me now. Does this sound okay? Yeah. You, you can, can hear me on here? Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah, so the bit that Steve is showing you in the center of the detector, so that's actually the section that I worked on for my, my PhD. So when Steve was mentioning, mentioning the tracking detector, uh, that is uh, at the very heart of the detector, and it measures these charged particles created from the, the new particles created in the collision uh, as they traverse through the tracking detector. Um, and it really needs to be what we call radiation hard, because so many particles pass through it. These particles can knock out atoms in the silicon, or it can just cause general damage. Um, and so what we need to do is to design tech detectors uh, that can really last a long time uh, whilst we're running. Um, and so that was my job, was to design these detectors, uh, to test them, uh, to really push them to their limits, to make sure we knew exactly how long they would last, because you don't want to install something in this cavern and then uh, not be able to access it for three to four years, um, two to three years, depending on which run we're in. Uh, and have it not work by the end of it. So we really want to understand our detectors completely. Um, and so that's, that's the section of the detector that I worked on. And it was a really interesting task. It's a very uh, nice piece of, of detector component. Well, maybe uh, now would be a good time for us to take a little break and to let you ask us your questions that you have. Uh, about uh, anything, about the particle physics we're doing, the detector, our collaborations. Um, I will turn this around. There we go. So we'll, we'll turn it over to you. Yep. Absolutely. That was an unimaginable experience we all got here. Now I would like all the moderators to pose your question. Hello, sir. Good evening. Hello. Good, good evening. Uh, there is a first question from Tej Dalwadi. Uh, how can quantum computing be useful for LHC in future? That's a, that's a really good question. And we, we, have, we are looking into that. Uh, it was discussed briefly. We have a very large um, conference. It's called Computing and High Energy Physics, which we just held in Adelaide last November. The topic was brought up, but we really don't have an answer to that question yet. Quantum computing is still very in its very early stages. Obviously, we, we need computing that can uh, that can handle large quantities of data and that can work very quickly. We have many different uh, requirements. We, we have uh, computing that's used just to, to read out the data from the detectors we have computing that's used to make quick decisions uh, on whether to keep uh, the data with triggering. Uh, much of that's now gone with software that used to be more electronics, but it's mainly software. Uh, we have one of the things that takes up the most uh, computing is simulation. Uh, we try to simulate what things we can expect to see. We have a model, and so we can simulate uh, what we expect and then compare that to the data, that uses tremendous amounts of computing power and is probably the most likely area where we'll be using it if we, when we do use it. But I don't think that quantum computing is yet mature enough uh, for us to be able to apply it. I do know there are efforts within the field to look into that, but I, I don't know, uh, you know the results yet. I think it's in the future. Thank you, sir. Um, hello, sir. Hello, ma'am. Uh, next question is, uh, how does it sound like when you turn the Large Hadron Collider on? Uh, 
So that's a great question. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, okay. Uh, so uh, nobody knows because nobody is allowed to be down here. Um, so we, we can't hear the large hadron collider or the detector when it's actually running uh, because when it is actually running, the localized radiation is very high. So it would be too dangerous for a person to be down here. Uh, but it's actually very quiet um, as far as we can tell. Uh, yeah. So the, there's no, when the particle collision happens, it's not, it's, it's very, it's a large amount of energy, but in a very, very small amount of space. So actually, globally, it's not a large amount of energy. So it wouldn't, it's not as noisy as that, for example. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. it's much louder now. I would say, yeah. actually, there, there, I should say there's, um, there are artists who we've invited over here. There's a big program at CERN called Art at CERN. If you know any great artists, please point them towards that, Art at CERN. And uh, one of them, at least a few of them, have been interested in sound. One is a sound engineer, uh, a famous uh, artist from, uh, from Switzerland, in fact. And uh, he measured what the different vibrations sound like. But, I mean, just to keep in mind exactly what Kara said, uh, when there is a proton collision, uh, that amount of energy is minuscule. The total amount of energy there in a proton collision is, is like a mosquito flying. It's a very, very small. If you take it off your hands, it's more energy uh, than uh, what happens when protons run into each other. Uh, it's just that the trick that we've done, when you read early on, and you still read them saying that we're rebuilding the conditions just after the Big Bang, well, we're doing that in a very, very small area. It's a high energy density. When you clap your hands to, to hear the sound of the, of the LHC, uh, it, you won't hear much. If you were to put uh, two thumbtacks on your hands and then clap them together, don't do that. But that would hurt. That tells you what energy density is. Same amount of energy, but it's concentrated. And so that's essentially what we have here is we have a, it, it's concentrated into the size of a, of a needle. And, uh, and by doing that, we can sort of recreate a little bit of what it was like uh, just after the Big Bang. The energy density. But the, the total amount of energy is very, very, very small. <laughs> Thank you, sir. The next question is, what are the observable characteristics of matter and antimatter when observed th through the Hadron Collider? Uh, well, essentially, uh, I'll, I'll just start. Okay. I'll correct everything I get wrong. Um, essentially, let me, let me try to paint the picture here. You have a whole bunch of protons on one side and a whole bunch on the other. Let's say a whole bunch. Every time a packet, we call these packets, there's 40 million packets of protons that pass through each other every second. A packet of protons is 100 billion protons. So a packet of protons is essentially uh, a galaxy. In fact, if you want to see, if you stick around for a few billion years, uh, you'll see uh, one of those interactions because you're going to see Andromeda pass through the Milky Way. Oh, yeah. It's going to happen. Don't worry about it yet. Uh, it's going to take a few billion years before that happens. But um, what, what's predicted when that happens is that no stars are going to come into direct contact with each other the first time it passes through. Uh, so that's, that's really impressive, right? You, you, they look like very dense clusters of stars, and they pass through each other. None of the stars are going to hit. The same thing would happen here with the protons, except that we take really, really strong magnetic fields and squeeze them together densely. And then when we're lucky, we get about 40 or 50 or maybe 60 out of 100 billion that collide. Now, what does it mean when they collide? I'm going to get to your answer. Just give me a second. I, want, I just want to paint the whole picture. Uh, when a proton passes through another proton, most of the time, nothing happens. Same thing. Just like in outer space, how there's a lot of space, there's a lot of nothing in outer space, there's a lot of nothing inside us as well. So there's a lot of nothing in a proton. It's mostly nothing. And then in the center, there's some quarks and gluons moving around. 
And to try to get them to interact, you have to have a lot of protons passing through each other. Finally, when they do interact, what happens is a couple of those will maybe exchange a particle uh, or produce a new particle. Okay? So when, for example, a Higgs boson is made, a couple of the gluons, these are, these are force-carrying particles, will interact and form a Higgs boson, which will then transform to other particles, which will then transform to other particles, which will then transform to other particles that we measure. Okay? So many, many different transformations happen. What we do is we measure what makes it out, the final particles that make it out. We see electrons, we see muons, uh, we see uh, photons, um, mainly, mainly those from the fundamental particles, the ones that are relatively stable. Muons aren't stable, but they last long enough for us to measure them. So we see these more stable things come out, and then we reconstruct back what were the different properties of the particles. So finally getting to answer your question. We measure the properties of those particles. One thing we can do is we can take the directions of the particles and their momentum and reconstruct what the mass would be of a particle if it had transformed to those particles that came out. We ask that question all the time. We look at all the data. We're looking for the Higgs boson. I'll give you a simple example. We look for two isolated photons. And from their angle and their energy, we suppose that they were produced by another particle that transformed into them. We calculate that one line of code to calculate the mass of that particle. We calculate that mass and we put it into a histogram. We plot it. We do this over and over and over and over again for millions of these. We plot all of these points and we expect to see if there's no Higgs boson a nice smooth curve which we simulate instead we see a little bit of a bump and that bump the position of that bump tells us the mass of the Higgs boson the, the width of the bump can be interesting too it tells us a bit about the resolution of our detector or it can tell us about the lifetime of the particle if we once we take out the resolution so we can measure masses, we can measure the, 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 the widths of their masses, it's a very important measurement. But also, just like what Clara said, you count. How many times did we get that Higgs boson out of all the collisions we had? Or how many times did we produce something else out of all the collisions? Counting the number of times you see something tells you the probability of producing it. We call these cross sections. So you simply now the possibility, what is the probability of producing it? And that's a measurement of our model and tells us whether our model is correct or not. Her mentioned that if sometimes you produce something more than you expected, that can mean that there's some other way to produce it, which can mean there's some new physics. So there's many different ways we can see new physics. So we measure these different properties. We measure the tracks that come out, their momentum, their energy, their angles. We then reconstruct properties like the mass of the original particle that produced it. So there's one example. And yeah. There's, things, there's many other things we measure, spin and things like this. Uh, so, but one, uh, one aspect of your question to add is that we uh, produce uh, particles and antiparticles in the collision, and they look identical in our detector, so depending on the type of particle you're looking for. So, for example, if you're looking for an electron, then this would pass through our tracking detector and then we would measure it in our calorimeter. And if you were looking at a positron, which is an anti-electron, you would see exactly the same thing, but because of the magnets that we've got in our detector, as Steve was saying earlier about bending the charged particles with the very strong magnets, the electrons and the positrons bend in different directions because the only difference between them is their charge. And so that's one way that we can identify the, the charge of the particle and whether it's a particle or an antiparticle. Hopefully that. So long, long answer to a short question. Yeah. I'm not good at that. Either. Thank you. Start on, ma'am. So our next question will be from uh, Rudra Singh. We read that uh, Higgs boson was confirmed by the LHC. Would you guys please explain 
what detectors you actually used to come to the conclusion to confirm Higgs boson? Yeah, we used all of them. <laughs> well, so uh, when we're talking about the Atlas experiment, and we're talking about the sub-detectors that build the Atlas experiment, we require every single section to, as Steve was saying about the identification of particles, we need each of them to determine uh, which particles are created at the end uh, of the Higgs boson creation. Um, so we need the tracking detectors to track where charged particles are gone. We need the calorimeters to measure the energy of some of the particles. And we need the muon detectors to measure the muons at the end. Uh, in terms of the experiments on the Large Hadron Collider, the Higgs was discovered by the Atlas collaboration, which is our collaboration, and the CMS collaboration. And although sometimes we joke that we're rivals, it's a very friendly rivalry. Uh, because we need CMS to discover what we discover. Because if we find something on our own, that's very exciting. But if CMS finds it too, that's a confirmation. So for the Higgs boson discovery, we really needed both experiments to see it at the same rate, uh, in the same final state of the, the particles that are created from the Higgs. And we compare notes and we say, okay, this is what we saw, this is what you saw, they look very similar, we can confidently say that we found any particles. So the rivalry that comes in is we want to find it first. Uh, that's the friendly rivalry mm -hmm. that we want to be a little bit faster. Yeah, we usually a little bit better than them. <laughs> yeah. Uh, maybe uh, if some of you maybe have heard of the Higgs boson but might not know its whole story, I can give it to you very briefly why it was important. Um, I mentioned before that what we're considering are particles, are fundamental particles. They, they have no volume to them. Okay, so, you know, we, as humans, we get our mass from what we ate last night, right? At least I do. And I guess, hey, I get more and more massive. But, you know, you eat something, you get energy, you get chemical binding energy. Most of our mass is this binding energy. And that's true even with at, at the fundamental levels, uh, like a proton, most of its mass is the binding energy, the thing that holds the quarks together. Uh, it's that energy. So one could ask, well, why would a fundamental particle something like a quark or an electron, which is not made up of other particles, have any mass at all? And that is a big question that we've had since the beginning, since the beginning of our field. Why? It was in 1964 that several prominent theorists thought about this and came up with an answer. And uh, so among them, you, you probably heard of Peter Higgs, there's Francois Anglaire and Robert Root. Uh, these are the three uh, really who are most well-known, although there were other physicists also working on it at the time. They proposed a, a, a mechanism, and that mechanism essentially states that there's a field that condensed. It appeared shortly after the Big Bang. Before that field appeared, everything was massless. Everything was moving at light, every which way. And then that field appeared, and it when a particle interacts with that field, it gets mass. Or another way to say it is that its mass is a measure of how much it interacts with that field. So this is the questions we had. Now, because of this, they could predict the different ways the Higgs boson would transform to other particles, but it depends on the mass of the Higgs boson, and that was not in the theory anyway. We had no idea what the mass of that particle would be. In addition, these theorists told us, don't even bother looking for it because the interaction is so weak, you would need you know, gazillions of collisions to produce something like this. So we said, great, let's make, let's make an accelerator that can produce gazillions of collisions and look for it. It took us a long time. It took us almost 50 years. And what we're seeing, so they predicted that we would see it in different ways. We looked in all the different mass ranges, uh, and it had been narrowed down from other accelerators on one side and from cosmological measurements on the other side until finally we knew that when we built the LHC, somewhere in that region, we should be able to find the Higgs boson. The Higgs boson 
uh, is an excitation of that field. Okay, every field is a particle, and every particle is a field. And if you think that's really cool, then you should go in the field. That's what I did. Okay? That's just what drew me in the particle position. Okay, uh, I'm not going to explain that now. We won't go through quantum mechanics here. Uh, but that fact made it fascinating made it that we had something we could look for. We found the Higgs boson decaying to the particles as it was predicted at, at a specific mass. That mass was not predictable or predicted. And we don't know exactly what that mass means at the moment. But what's really fascinating is that since we've discovered it, we've seen it transform to other particles exactly as predicted. It has transformed. We have seen it, we have seen it interacting with the top core, with the bottom core. We've seen it interacting with the tau lepton and, uh, and also with the Z boson and the W boson. And then now recently we've seen evidence for it interacting with muons directly as well. All of those measurements give us data points on a line. We can plot a line that shows that the interaction with the, with the particle goes as the mass. And, and that's just, to me, it's amazing. It's a logarithmic measurement. It's just so beautiful. You make a log plot and you can see this line that goes straight through it. To look at that plot, it gives, it gives one really hope for humanity where that we're able to make such a complex uh, prediction and, and, and then to build these detectors to find it. And I know we're not so great with a lot of other things. We're destroying our planet, for example, but we have capability. And maybe our species has hope. To be able to do something like that is, is really an amazing feat. Yeah, maybe just to add one point. So from what Steve was saying about the particles that the Higgs was interacting with, what you might have noticed is that he was mentioning all of the heavier particles. So these are the ones that we, as he was saying, expect to interact the most with the Higgs boson because they have the heaviest mass, so we expect them to have the highest interaction. So it's not a coincidence that my the ones that I've been looking at are the top quark of the tau because these are very heavy particles and it, it allows us to have more events to look at. But one of the very first channels that we discovered the Higgs boson in was the Higgs to two photons. And a very good question is, how do you have Higgs to two photons when the photon is massless and therefore you don't have an interaction with the Higgs? So it, it gets a little bit complicated because we have what are called virtual particles. And so it's a momentary interaction of the Higgs with these heavier particles, which can themselves then create photons. Um, but it's a very, very rare event. So how did we use this channel to discover the Higgs? Well, again, it was something that Steve mentioned earlier. The photon, two photons, is a very distinguished signature in our detector. It's very easy to look for two photons uh, and recombine their mass and say, or that we get the invariant mass, and say that was a Higgs boson, we think, because it has the same mass that we expect. And some of these other heavier particles, for example, tau, are super messy. They like to spray all of these other particles into our detector, and we have to reconstruct them, and it gets very complicated. So we're not just looking at the amount of times things happen, but also how clean it is in our detector, and how many other things have the same signature, because sometimes we can get a little bit confused with the other particles that could create the same signature, and we really have to very carefully uh, allocate which one came from a Higgs boson, which one came from something else. So sometimes a very nice clean signature is actually the easiest way to discover a new particle. Thank you. So the next question is, how often are you guys able to predict what discoveries you will make? For example, when you found the Higgs boson, there had already been predictions that it would be found at some point in time as our technology improved. Are there any other examples of less known expected breakthroughs? And does the accuracy of these predictions vary from different areas of research? That's a, that's a very good question. So there's a whole, there are teams of theorists giving us predictions all the time. 
Like, that's their job. They write a lot of papers. They look at our measurements and they say, you know, if this is true and this is true and this is true, then I predict such and such. Here's, here's a theory that predicts this. Um, right now, there is nothing, nothing as clean as the Higgs boson. The Higgs boson was worked on for a very long time. Uh, it was searched at the low end, at the high end. And we were very confident that we would find it when we built the LHC, or that we would find nothing, which would have been great, too. Yeah, I think that's a really important, a really important point to make. So the LHC would have either found the Higgs boson or would have shown that it didn't exist. And both of those answers were very exciting. Um, so it was just, it was that the LHC would finally answer the question, but we didn't know for certain that there would be an Higgs boson. Yeah. It could have been something else. So for, for other theories right now, I mean, there's several things out there. Uh, there's a lot of things we don't understand. I, I mentioned a few of them. Yeah. You know, we, uh, the main things that are out there that we don't understand, uh, I mentioned 95% of our universe. Uh, we know from uh, astronomical measurements that our universe is expanding at a faster and faster rate. The, the rate of, of expansion is accelerating. And if you measure that, the, there has to be some huge amount of energy out there that we're not accounting for. There's something very large out there that's missing. And that's most of our universe. Some 60-something percent of our universe is this thing which we just named dark energy because we have no clue what it is. Okay? And that's probably not something we're going to find at the LHC. Okay? There, there are some ideas, but I doubt it. However, another very large part of what's missing is dark matter some stuff out there that we, we don't understand. We know it's there. We have more and more measurements of its existence. Okay, so uh, a, a very brilliant woman, there are many people who came up with different ideas of dark matter. Perhaps the most famous is a wonderful uh, astronomer named Vera Rubin. Uh, she's another great woman scientist who should have gotten a Nobel Prize but didn't. And I will go on record in saying that. <laughs> Absolutely. There's no doubt about that. Uh, she was. She came up. She got some, her hands on some equipment that allowed her to measure the movement of stars and galaxies. The prediction she had for that was that they would move similar to the way planets move around the sun. You know, that's all Newtonian physics. We know that you know Mercury and Venus will move faster, and Neptune and Pluto will move slower because that's what they do at those different radii. Uh, but that turned out not to be the case uh, when looking at the stars and the galaxy. Uh, it turned out that they were moving uh, at a very similar rate. The stars on the outside are moving quite fast, and we measured that over and over again. She measured it, but now we've got very high precision on these measurements. And it looks like roughly the, the amount of mass, the amount of matter that we see in a galaxy is only about 15%. In other words, about 85% of a galaxy is stuff we don't see, we don't interact with it, we don't understand what it is. Furthermore, we have these nice mappings that are made of the universe looking at light uh, from all around the distant stars and distant, distant clusters of galaxies, for example. And you can see an effect that's called lensing when light uh, gets affected by a magnetic, by a, by a, uh, a gravitational field. The light will bend. The Einstein showed this, right? This is general relativity. Light will bend uh, around something. So we know that there's these bits of mass out there which are bending light, and we don't know what they are. This dark matter is really perplexing. Uh, we don't know what it is. If it is a particle, and it, and it looks like really it probably should be the existence of some sort of particle. Is it a massive particle? Is it a, is it uh, a very light mass particle where there's a lot of them. Uh, why doesn't it interact with the stuff that we know about? Are we just idiots? We haven't, you know, we should be able to detect it, but we haven't built a detector to detect it yet. Uh, for whatever reason, we don't detect it. We're looking for that all the time. There's many different experiments looking for that. There's a certain associated experiment called the uh, AMS, which is up on the International Space Station, Alpha Muon Spectrometer up there. Uh, there's also um, uh, uh, small, there's experiments which are down in, in shafts, in mine shafts, where it's very, very quiet, 
looking for dark matter that could pass through it there, because dark matter is obviously passing through us all the time. And in addition, our experiments, you know, if you notice, if you look uh, at the detector, I'm not very good at this when I'm looking this way, but if you look at our detector, you can't really see it like that well from here. It's completely round, right? We completely surround the collision point with the detector. Now, since the protons are, are passing, you know, one, you know, one, they're going in a line like this, there's a plane that's perpendicular. When they deposit their mass, they deposit their, their uh, traps, their, if you take the momentum vectors of all of them and you, um, you plot them on that plane, you should be able to add those all up and get zero. So there's no momentum that's going transverse to the beam. Uh, yet we see sometimes there's some something came through and it was we didn't measure it, we didn't detect it. So if we see a lot of that, that can be a sign that we're producing dark matter. That's a you know prediction. There are different models that predict the production of dark matter. Uh, one of the models that predicts it is is actually a, a whole structure. Of, of theories, uh, and it's uh, it's called supersymmetry. You may have heard of that. That theory was sort of put together to try to fold together all the different forces that we have in our existing uh, model, uh, and to try to come up with a with a symmetry which which mathematically can explain all of our forces. As a part of that, it predicts other particles that exist that we haven't yet measured. The least massive of those could be dark matter. So there are some predictions for that. Some of those uh, models give you a mass or something to look for. Unfortunately, <laughs> they haven't gotten it yet. And a lot, a lot of those models have been thrown away because their predictions uh, didn't come true. But there's still a lot of space out there where it could be true. So there, there's no, I mean, it's been a really long answer to not give you a real answer yeah. because there are, there's nothing right now, there's no, specific predictions uh, that we can look for. On the other hand, we know the whole area we haven't measured. There's whole continents out there that we haven't been to, that we haven't measured, whole ranges of energy uh, that we haven't reached. So we have a whole area we can explore and hopefully get some clues and, and learn about what else is out there. So that's where we're at now. It's really pure exploration. It's very exciting right now. Thank you. Uh, how does it feel to be to be a physicist, and how does it feel to be a part of an experiment which deal with knowing the basis of the existence? Great. Yeah. <laughs> how can I answer that? <laughs> um, you know, everybody has different paths to the careers that they go into. Uh, I. I, I feel like I fell into this. I don't know. I, I've never lived another life before this one that I know of, that I remember. So this life has been, I've been very fortunate. I, I studied different things. Uh, and, and in my undergraduate career, I studied mathematics just to study mathematics. But at some point I decided uh, that it was more interesting to see mathematics applied to the physical world than I went into to physics. And then I got very lucky because once I started as a graduate student, I immediately got a phone call that they needed people to come out uh, to Europe to, to work on a new detector. Now, this is not this one. It was a long time before that. Uh, there used to be a different beam in this tunnel that had electrons and positrons. And it was when that was being turned on around 1989 is when it came on. That's when I was working on my PhD uh, thesis. Uh, we were just at that time measuring a different boson. Uh, we had found the Z boson, or Z boson, in 1983, I think it was, when it was discovered. And by 1989, we started producing lots of them. And we, make, we used that to measure, and, and my thesis was on how many particles, how many families of particles exist in the universe. Uh, so, you know, everybody has a different story to tell about how they came into the field. I can just tell you, from my point of view, I was, I was very lucky. It's a thrill to be here. Everybody I work with is smarter than I am. You should always try to get in an environment where everybody's smarter than you. You always learn. I never feel that I'm working. Uh, I always want to do the stuff that I have to do because I'm contributing to this experiment. 
uh, and, and it's, it's amazing. And I get to meet people from absolutely all around the globe. Uh, lately, I've, I've had the fortune that, that my colleagues have asked me to chair this group called the International Particle Physics Outreach Group. Uh, in that case, we're bringing the physics to people all around the globe. I get to do things like this all the time, which I love, uh, and I get to meet a lot of different people. Back, back in the old days, before masks, you know, uh, I would travel a lot, and I would meet a lot of different people, and I hope to do that again. But in the meantime, meeting uh, this way is, is, is great as well. Uh, so it's, a, it's, I don't know, I'm sure Clara has got an even better story about it here in the field. I mean, it's a similar feeling. It's such an honor to be working on an experiment like this. Um, and to know, one of the wonderful things about talking to people about our work like this is that it reminds us how exciting and how important what we're doing is. Uh, when I'm working day to day and I'm programming and I get stuck with a computer bug and it gets frustrating, you get very drawn into the, the details, so it's wonderful to step back, to really look at the whole detector and to talk to people about what we're doing and just remind ourselves of that, that sense of excitement and enthusiasm. And myself, I didn't have a civics teacher in my school, so uh, I had a science teacher uh, who specialised in chemistry and another one who specialised in biology, so they were very enthusiastic about those subjects, but I didn't have someone in my school who was saying, how about physics, how about uh, learning about the very tiniest building blocks of the universe. Um, and I was fortunate that my parents are very enthusiastic about space, about astronomy, about the stars. Um, so they really started that passion for me. And as I explored more about the wider universe, then I wanted to learn more about how it was constructed and then you go from the absolutely impossibly massive galaxies and, and the greatest structures in our universe and you start to build it and you go back and you find that the, the building blocks are so super, super tiny um, and it's really exciting for me to be able to study something so fundamentally small which can explain structures on such a, a colossal scale. Um, and I, I really love what I do. I, I love the um, atmosphere at CERN, the collaboration. We have people from all over the world who work here, and we work together. And we don't care about countries or borders or backgrounds. We, we want to work together on the physics. Um, at least everybody that I've worked with, that's been the case. And it's just been so wonderful to learn from people from different, different backgrounds, different experiences. Uh, and to work on this, this really important goal together. I, I, I can tell you that there is one time every four years where you can drop all that stuff about the countries, and that's when there's the World Cup. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> then, then it's, you know, all bets are off, right? There's the flags flying everywhere. Yeah, that's true. When the Other sports come into yeah, it, the then, sports then it's very, very important. Yeah. <laughs> so the rugby as well and the cricket. That's true. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. That was so good to hear. As you know, the list is very long of questions, but we have time constraints. So here's the last one. What do you think about the ways the universe can end? The big crunch, the big grip, the big freeze. What are your thoughts? My personal opinion is if we can make it to 2020, I'll be happy. <laughs> <laughs> Because that's when we'll be able to have this conversation. This is a year we could have skipped as far as I can tell. Yeah. Um, so actually, some of the research that we're doing here at CERN can help answer one of the questions. So what we want to know is whether or not we live in a stable universe, or whether we live in what's called a metastable universe. Um, and so this is one of the ways that the universe, if you want to get into the really morbid section of it, this is one of the ways the universe could end, is that if we live in a very unstable universe, the laws of physics could instantaneously change to a more stable form. And if that happens, then there will be a ripple throughout the whole universe and everything will change and it could be that our planet can no longer be, exist in the way that it does. So one of the, and before you get worried, one of the measurements that we're doing is measuring the mass of the top and the mass of the bottom. We can look at this uh, interaction between them. 
and we get this very nice uh, block for us. Um, and it, it gives us a point to tell us how stable our universe is. And we're on the edge of uh, stability and metastability. So the more that we can learn about the Higgs boson and the Takwa, the better we can place ourselves on this graph. But being in a metastable universe is still a very reassuring thing because the likelihood of us tunneling into a different set of law of physics is so astronomically tiny that I'm not worried. I don't think that this is ever going to happen in the lifetime of the planet Earth or of our solar system or even longer. So it, it's one of the ways that the universe could end. Um, it's not something that I'm worried about. Uh, I actually would prefer it to, there's something called the cold uh, death of the universe, which is where, because of Steve was explaining that we're expanding, uh, our universe is expanding at this uh, increasing rate, eventually everything could expand so much that there's no energy, uh, there's no particles anymore because everything is just really, really far away. Um, and I think that's quite a sad. I'd yes, rather go out with it. I'd rather the big front. Go out with your bang. I mean, you know, you know, when when they were first looking at different theories of the, the universe, and they just learned about expansion. One of the people who had theories was a guy named Edgar Allan Poe. Oh, yeah. you know that? And, and his his uh, he he was dabbling with the, with astronomy as well. And of course, he had a, a horrible ending, as yeah. with all of his poems. I think everything crunched back together and is devastating. Yeah. Kind of the universe. We don't know. I, I'm pretty sure I'm not going to be around here for the end of the universe. Yeah. If we make it through 2020 all healthy and happy, then then I'll be fine with that. <laughs> yeah. So if you want, if this is something you want to know more about, then there's a, a physicist called uh, Dr. Katie Max, and she has a whole book that's just come out that explains all of oh, these yeah. different ways that the universe could end. Uh, and I'm sure that she's very reassuring <laughs> in her book about the, the different methods. So the, it, there's there's a whole research topic on this. Uh, on this area, but yeah, personally, I'm not worried. As he says, I would love to just make it to the end of 2020, and everyone to be as healthy and, and safe as possible. That that's my uh, short-term goal. Thank you, sir, and thank you, ma'am, for your patient replies and the answers which you gave. We are all delighted to have all uh, you two on board. Now I'll request Mr. Jaimin Chimpi to give the ending remarks. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, sir. Thank you, madam. Thank you. Thank you very much. And all the part. Yeah, yes, sir. I was going to say, I wish you a very good continuation of the program. The speakers you have look fantastic. It's very well organized, and I'm sure you're all going to enjoy it. And I also wish you, I know that India is having a tough time 
now as well uh, with COVID. So please stay safe and, and stay healthy. Same to you, sir. Same to you, sir. Same to you, man. I would request all the participants to stay on board because we are having quiz uh, of the session and exciting rewards are also given. And now I would like to announce the result of the ambassador program. The first winner is Swetal Patel. The second winner is Achal Kandoi. And the third winner is Druvil Nakum. Congratulations to all the winners. And now I'll move on to the section. <laughs>